While the world's been waiting, the world's we've been, been waiting, working, we've, we've been expanded to over 3 million square feet of studio space, space introduced world-class world safety world measures, class and our new Ontario Green Screen program will ensure a more sustainable, sustainable future. We are Ontario, we are and, Ontario we're ready to roll. and we're ready to roll. Very, very important very that, important that they put the stories, put the in, the stories in the hands of the people who, who own those stories. Own those stories. Classic stories, Classic stories, 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 stories are always going to have value. high value. Good filmmaking this requires vulnerability, vulnerability, and vulnerability, and requires, vulnerability courage. requires courage. And that's just what and we that's do. Just what we do. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last day of our industry conference. My name is Jeff McNaughton, and I'm the Senior Director of Industry and Theatrical here at TIFF. I'd like to welcome all of you to our micro session on reclaiming our time, stories, and screen for underrepresented Canadian creators. In this session, programming professionals from across the country will share their cur curating challenges, strategies, and recommendations to increase discoverability of racially diverse Canadian creators. Guiding us through this conversation is curator, programmer, and writer, Sarah Ty Black, who will introduce our speakers before we get started. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank lead sponsor Bell, major sponsors RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as major industry supporters, Telefilm Canada and Ontario Creates. This particular session is co-presented by Telefilm Canada. Um, so please enjoy, and Sarah, over to you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us bright and early Monday morning. Um, a big thank you to the Telefilm and TIFF industry team who have been working so hard behind the scenes to kind of share important spaces like this with all of us for uh, the festival season. I'm so excited for our conversation today and for the presence of our wonderful panelists who I will introduce to you shortly. Just a quick note before we start that for any questions that the audience may have that are specific to Telephone, Telephone Canada, we invite you to send them to info at telephone.ca. So as Jeff, as Jeff said, my name is Sarah Ty Black and I will be your moderator for today's panel, Reclaiming Our Time, Stories and Screens for Underrepresented Canadian Creators. I'm a film programmer, arts curator, writer and critic living here in Toronto, right next to the TIFF home base. Uh, you may have read my film reviews in the Globe and Mail, where I've been a freelance contributor for almost three years now, which is wild to me. Currently, I work mainly as an independent um, programmer and curator, but I'm also working alongside the programming teams at Tribeca and the one of... Um, I've also worked with the programming team here at TIFF, and I'm the former programmer of Images Festival also here in Toronto. The majority of my work, whether it's uh, officially outlined as such or not, really does take as its focus BIPOC filmmakers working within both Canada and abroad, um, as well as engaging in a meaningful way with BIPOC audiences, especially here in Toronto. So needless to say, today's topic is one that is very near and dear to me. So now let me introduce to you our lovely panelists. First off, we have Frances Ann Solomon, who is the executive director of Toronto's Caribbean Tales Film Festival. A trailblazer in the film and television industry, Frances Ann is an award-winning writer, producer, director, curator, and distributor in film, television, and radio. She started her professional life at the BBC in England, where she was a successful television drama producer and executive producer in single drama and films. In 2001, she became the founder and CEO of the Caribbean Tales Media Group, which produces, exhibits, and distributes Caribbean-themed content from around the world. In 2014, she founded Cinefam, a nonprofit organization that showcases and supports women creatives of color worldwide. 
2020 marks the launch of the Windrush, Windrush Caribbean Film Festival in the UK, of which she is the co-founder. Her work as a director includes the feature films Hero, inspired by the extraordinary life and times of Mr. Ulrich Cross, What My Mother Told Me, Peggy Sue, A Winter Tale, and the series Lord Have Mercy and Heartbeat. She is a director member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and a member of the Directors Guild of Canada. Welcome, Frances Ann. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. We're also joined today by Tara Lynn Taylor, who is the co-founder and festival director of the Emerging Lens Film Festival in Halifax. A filmmaker, playwright, actress, and multidisciplinary artist, Tara has worked in the film industry for 19 years. As a casting director, she has worked to form the BIPOC cast and crew for the CBC series Studio Black, as well as the upcoming series Black Films That Teach for East Link TV. She is the vice chair and diversity and inclusive committee team lead of the Link Performing Arts Society, a member of the board of Center for Art Tapes, chair of the membership committee for Screen Nova Scotia, and vice chair of Women in Film and Television Atlantic Chapter. Tara has produced and in some cases starred in Dream Girls, The Color Purple, and The Wiz, written an original musical about the life of Viola Desmond, which was staged at the Spats Theater in 2018 and Dartmouth Players Theater in 2019, and is currently writing new musical works entitled Hood Habits and Love, Peace, and Hair Grease in the Playwrights Unit under Easton Front Theater. Her newest role as a partner in broadcast company, a cultural evolution TV corporation, will, will provide a platform for underrepresented voices. Welcome, Tara. Thank you for having me, everyone. And last but certainly not least, we are joined by Anushka Ratnaraja, who is the artistic director of the Vancouver Queer Film Festival. She is a mixed race queer femme of Sri Lankan and British ancestry and an interdisciplinary artist and arts organizer. She has worked as a producer, performer, writer, facilitator, and arts organizer, arts organizer with cultural and arts organizations in Vancouver, Montreal, and New York. Anushka is invested in creating and supporting work that shines a light on histories and contemporary stories that are underrepresented in mainstream film, theater, and performance. Anushka has been a fellow with the Hemispheric Institute for Performance and Politics and Voices of Our Nation Arts. She has a BFA in Creative Writing and a BA in Women and Gender Studies from the University of British Columbia, as well as an MA in Arts Politics from NYU. You gave us this bio, Anushka, and I'm reading it. I'm proud of you. <laughs> she is currently the Artistic Director at Out on Screen, which produces the annual Vancouver Queer Film Festival and the year-round Out in Schools program. Thank you all for being here. Thank what a list for of having us. to read off. <laughs> So I want to kick off our discussion today by kind of um, gently pushing back against this idea of quote unquote discoverability in terms of BIPOC creators working in Canada. Um, I think that a lot of what we're going to speak to today are issues of support and collaboration and funding and national and provincial histories and viewership, all of which are undeniably important for BIPOC filmmakers working in this country. But I also want to be a little firm about this other very important idea that there is a history in Canada, a hard-earned history for sure, and one that maybe too often moves in the margins um, of BIPOC filmmakers finding home and finding support within community, whether that be fellow BIPOC programmers, audiences, or both. And I think that's really what draws together this panel today is that truth that we have always sought out work from our own communities, regardless regardless or not of whether that work or, you know, even our work in programming that work or supporting that work was seen by the quote unquote main, larger mainstream industry. So again, I do kind of want to push back against this idea that um, the problem lies in us needing to be found by others because we have, you know, we've always seen each other. And this question, well, I think it, of course, probably has good intentions behind it of really positions us to think about how can a largely white industry see us better or even see us at all, which is not really our responsibility to answer to, you know, because we've always been here. So yeah. <laughs> on that note, Anushka, Francis, and Natara, if you could start us off by talking a bit about the organizations you work with and their role in supporting and contributing to the development and promotion of Canadian BIPOC talent. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I guess I can go first. <laughs> um, so Emerging Lens, um, this year actually marks our 10th year anniversary. So we're quite uh, proud of that. Um, we actually did start out in the beginning 
um, being for the first few years being com predominantly um, African Nova Scotian programming. And then we realized that um, there were, you know, some other BIPOC folks that, you know, were still under uh, marginalized, not just our, ourselves. And so we we call ourselves BIPOC featured now. So we welcome um, anyone and everyone, but their their work must feature um, BIPOC um, representation in their cast and their crew and and whatnot. So we just we're very proud to provide that platform um, for their voices and for their stories, and um, as well as um, welcoming you know, non-BIPOC folks is working. And actually we're quite proud that but now they're creating work around our stories and um, uh, because of because of this platform. Amazing. Um, I really agree with you, Sarah Tai. Uh -huh. um, the uh, Caribbean Tales Media Group started 20 years ago um, because of a need that our community had just internationally, which is the Caribbean diaspora, including every population that Caribbean people came from and went to. So um, African, Indian, um, uh, Lebanese, Chinese, um, the Af and then places that we went to, which is there are huge populations of Caribbean people in every urban center of the world. Um, and really the, uh, the group started because of a need, you know, the audiences love, and we always pack our, our cinemas, um, love to see themselves on screen. They love to see themselves, period. Um, and, so, and so I think that our strength just internationally has just been to connect with our diaspora. So just to give you a little bit of a description, um, the media group includes the F International Film Festival, our creators of, which is now in its 15th year, Creators of Color Incubator Program, Caribbean Tales Worldwide Distribution that distributes uh, 400 films, our VOD platform, Caribbean Tales TV, our production uh, company, and then uh, Cinefam has its own um, pipeline of activities from creation through distribution and our British company, um, is as well, but it's really to meet a need. And so your point about about discoverability by whom is very relevant because it's only in the last few years and, and now that, um, you know, white institutions have, uh, have chosen to see us, to let us in and to, to their particular uh, club. Uh, I feel we have a huge and wide reach that is global. Um, and we do know each other, we do see each other. Thank you. Um, so I am coming from a little bit of a different place because I work for an institution that has been dominantly white for um, a long time. Um, I work for Out on Screen, which produces the Vancouver Queer Film Festival, which just had its 32nd festival, first ever digital. Uh, in August, um, and uh, that was that's it's been my fourth year um, as the artistic director there. Um, and if anyone knows histories of queer communities and um, uh, queer and trans rights and um, their fight for the fight for visibility, but also human rights, um, we haven't always been uh, intersectionally um, we haven't always been as intersectional and as caringly intersectional as we could be. Um, so there, you know, there have always been films by queer folks of color in the festival for as long as it's existed because um, the the need for that content um, as an as queer community is an, another underrepresented um, group of folks. Um, you know, the need for that um, for that representation um, was deep and meaningful um, for anyone who has been watching those films for the past three decades. Um, but whiteness uh, is still centered in queer experience on screen. And, um, you know, we live in a colonial state, so it's centered all the time in every single possible way that 
can exist. Um, so my challenge continually, and luckily I work for an organization that is supportive and learning, um, is to increase that representation within the festival, um, but also make sure that our workplace is a safer place for BIPOC um, to be working, um, because I know the rush, I mean, we're seeing this now, like the rush for representation and the rush for equitable representation at, um, at all levels of the film industry is like very intense right now. Um, obviously we're having, um, a cult there's a cultural moment going on, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that representation won't be tokenized and that, you know, the organizations that we work for will be a safe place for, um, for artists to live and work. Um, and so that that continues to be an ongoing, um, that will just always be my work, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think that's um, sadly kind of a thing that maybe trauma bonds BIPOC folk in the industry together <laughs> is um, this aspect of working within uh, these institutions and protecting not only ourselves, but the, the work that we're trying to bring in there. Um, and so touching on that a little, and Anushka, you spoke to this really well. I was wondering for all of you, considering how much experience you have, I'm still slightly out of breath reading all of the bios. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to your experience as programmers working within larger institutions, as opposed to how you have all, or at least Tara and Francis, and specifically found your home in smaller community-minded organizations and initiatives and nonprofits. And, for all of you, I really am wondering also what are the differences you've seen um, also in the way that BIPOC talent have, have been or maybe haven't been supported within these different orbits. Mm. That, that good old checking off the box. <laughs> I, I just, I don't have a whole lot to say there um, other than working for the large institutions, that's what it's been, you know, like we, we need to fulfill a mandate. We have to show, you know, um, A, B and C and you know when there's been a great story it we we have too much you know we've already programmed two out of the 50 <laughs> so we have enough you know that's that's basically what my experience has been here on the east coast and so that's why it's so refreshing that um, emerging lens gets to program everything and anything we are also global so it's amazing to be connected to a lot of uh, bipoc creators of, around the world and that are just telling amazing stories in terms of um of my experience um my 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 initial experience was working with the bbc um i worked my way up as a from the production trainee program to being an executive producer in drama where i was the token i was only i was always the only uh, person of color in the departments that i worked in at the time um and i really left in because i felt that um, just psych, cycle, and I left England because I felt that um, my mental health was not going to sustain actually work, continuing to work in under that amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the systemic, the way that systemically you're constantly undermined and isolated, and also um, kind of cornered uh, at, at at every point, you know, financially, um, thematically, in terms of being kind of pushed into various stereotypical storylines, um, deprived of resources, labeled um, in very, I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And I just felt that I couldn't just sustain that and that I wanted to start my own organization where at least I would define the culture. So the culture of, of my company and the partnerships that we have that, you know, it's, it's a black owned female led organization and and it makes a huge difference to the culture that is our culture anybody coming in those are the kind of parameters that they they come into and then the partnerships that we have they may be difficult or whatever but it, it's it's much easier but i have to say that what i gave up <clears throat> was obviously uh resources so uh, working in poverty for so long because of the deprivation um that we suffer as uh as black creators and black content creators has been really, really, you know, shocking. Um, and you know, the only 
the only um, solace that I have really is that we all suffer from that isolation and from that poverty. I mean, fundamentally, you're deprived of a, of a living, of the opportunity to make a living, so you have to be driven by passion. The statistics speak for themselves in terms of the representation of women of color in the screen-based industries in relation to the population. It's outrageous, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anushka? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, I think the it's it's when you when you inhabit multiple um uh, uh, marginalized identities as i'm as like we all do um it's amazing uh the ways in which you'll be asked to only inhabit one of those um and represent one of those over and over and over again um they just want you to be a woman or they just want you to be pock or they just want you to be queer or they just want you to be this that the other um and so um, it feels often like you're fighting on multiple fronts, um, especially when you, you know, as programmers, our job is to platform stories and to create space for representation to be seen on screen, to create space for our communities, to have the same cathartic and um, to have the same cathartic and imaginative experiences that white folks you know, have been able to have in this industry since, you know, day one. Um, mm -hmm. Just think about the way that imagination has been um, colonized and siloed for people of color um, and how many stories are missing because of that. It's atrocious. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, it can feel like an uphill battle with larger institutions. Mm -hmm. um, working in a sort of mid-sized institution as I am now, I feel more empowered to create change from within. Um, although there are definitely days where, you know, I, I want to burn it all down and <laughs> start, start anew. Um, but I think we all have days like that, I, I hope. Um, um, yeah. yeah, and so I think that, um, I think that it's so, yeah, it's such a it's it's it can be a really hard place and a really isolating place, as you've both spoken to mm -hmm. um, working from there, especially when you're a woman of color. I think there's like there's a lot of other stuff that happens um, for for those of us who inhabit that particular identity um, and the expectations that are put upon us um, by our communities and also by the people that we work with and the institutions that we engage with. So, um, yeah, it's not an easy place to live in, but all the time, but then you also get the joy of, um, bringing those stories to the people that you care about. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's nothing better than that feeling of being in a room with everyone when they're having that experience together and they're laughing and they're crying and you're like, <laughs> I did this, <laughs> you know, and that really does make it all worth it, which is why I hate this digital life, because that's not <laughs> something I can have right now, which is really hard. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, keeping the storytelling at the center of it is is always the most important thing for me. Um, and the thing that gives me solace on my hardest days when white supremacy is exhausting. It's Yes. It's still there. You wake up every day. There it is, looking right <laughs> in the face. It doesn't, it doesn't go away. It just, the emotional labor that you always, now, even now, have to expend to negotiate the the ignorance, the microaggressions, the all the kind of you know things that are are embedded in your daily transactions. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like five jobs. <laughs> and then you have your work to do, you know? Yeah. 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 Something that um, has really struck me about um, this panel and knowing that I was going to get to speak to the three of you was that I don't think a panel like this would have existed when I first started programming. And as a Black programmer, I didn't really have a lot of folks to turn to. Of course, there's like Cameron Bailey, but it's like you can't <laughs> like at the top. <laughs> You know, and it's when you're looking towards your own community, the own people that you share space with, people who are maybe your peers are also emerging. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't really see a lot of that. Um, so 
in terms of our conversation today, I was wondering um, for emerging BIPOC programmers who are watching this, um, if, if you three would like to speak a bit about the sort of institutional or non-institutional supports um, that have really helped to guide your work as programmers. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, Telefilm itself has been extremely, um, and specifically if I'm allowed to name names, Denise Jameson, uh, project leader, ha um, has been invested not only financially, but, um, you know, just invested emotionally and wants to wanted to see our, our uh, BIPOC film creators um, just succeed and the the film festival succeed i mean we're emailing back and forth constantly just to she's checking in just to make sure that you know where you know our programming is um not only meeting gu uh, guidelines and criteria but that we are um tapping into all the community members that we possibly can and we're she knows that we are <laughs> but i'm glad that she's on top of it and um cares a lot about it and always shows up to our opening nights our opening nights are always jam-packed full of multicultural faces and I love it. You know, people are coming out to see these stories and um, just to share in that emotional roller coaster that Anishka you mentioned. And um, it's it's it actually um, I really feel I real I feel special, you know, like <laughs> you know, that we we matter to these people, to to our funders and to our sponsors. And I believe that's why I mean I that there's struggle elsewhere, but we struggle it as a support uh, at it, but we didn't have to work at it too too much. You know, when you're when you come with um, with a heart and a passion for these creators, and you put their stories in front of them, you say, "Look, we matter too." You know, and we have a voice. We don't have to convince you of anything other than come and enjoy the stories. Then they 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 really look to that, and they look forward to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that um, for the first, because our company and our festival is now 15 years old. And uh, for the longest while, um, many years, we got absolutely no support from, from Canadian. Well, I'll put it another way. Our support came from the Caribbean and from Africa. So our, our um, institutional support really was international. And it was an irony because our platform and our home and we are Canadian. Um, so that, that was very difficult to live with. Um, and again, about, I would say about five years ago, uh, we were quote unquote discovered by Francesca Accinelli, um, who said literally, I had no idea. And, and, and I have to take my hat off. She's a, she's an incredible person who really has, um, done the work and, um, to understand the, the barriers that, that we have to, to, we have faced in the past. And she's committed to, to change and to transformation, uh, which is what she has been doing since I met her. Um, and, and I would also take my hat off to Telefilm because, because I do believe that, that despite uh, huge difficulties in the past, particularly the festivals department, but now I feel the organization as a whole are committed to change, as is, as is the Canadian industry, really. I, f I, I feel that there is a genuine movement. And I say this from the perspective of also still being invested in the UK movement, in the UK industry, because that is has always been is very very slow and is taking a lot of time to catch up so comparatively i feel happy to be canadian and grateful to be <laughs> yeah i mean for um young programmers of color i would say um there's an opportunity now to really push for what you want and to for institutions and funders to have to listen. Um, so take advantage of the moment that we're currently in mm -hmm. um, and make sure you surround yourself with um, supportive colleagues and allies and and your community as well. Um, you know, our audiences are incredible advocates for the work that we do. Um, and um, they're really the ones who we do this work for. We don't do it for our funders. We don't do it for, you know, like, <laughs> you know, um, even though there are individual people who work for these funding organizations who I see every year at the festival and who I'm so grateful 
people that they feel like they're part of community as well. Um, and that also is such an opportunity, um, I think, to have that engagement and um, for, for those folks to see like the actual impact of what they're funding um, on the ground is really important. But mm -hmm. yeah, I would say, I would say make sure that you have like the emotional support in your life that you need to do this <laughs> job. Um, um, really to do any job that is about um, equitable representation. I mean, it's gonna be, it's, it's, it can be really hard sometimes. Um, yeah, and I mean, we've seen an increase in support um, over the last, I would say, like decade and really speeding it up in the last five years for um, Canadian funding institutions um, to to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to um, when it comes to underrepresented folks, particularly folks of color. Um, they still, there's still a really long way to go, but um, you can push for that support and you can ask for it. Um, be propositional is what I would say is like, now is kind of the time to dream big. Um, I feel like, you know, like we're at this moment, we just like push it a little bit further open and we can like maybe change something of the world <laughs> yeah, truly if yeah. they give you an inch take a mile and don't feel right. bad about it yeah all. yeah never a mile. <laughs> yeah never like always ask for more um and because you know like white folks are doing that and they don't even know that they're doing it yeah. it's just like part of their privilege and they're like oh i should have this obviously it's fine <laughs> <laughs> what would it be like to live like that? I have no idea. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we internalize that thing of like not being able to ask for what we need. Yeah. And we should, we should ask for more than what we need. So along the lines of this story has been told 10 times, but give me a million dollars or 10 million to tell it again. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's being told by you. But yeah. also I want to, I want to really, um, I want to I want to really look beyond the moment. I have the benefit or the or the maybe the the, the the bad luck to have been around like my career started in nineteen eighty six and that was when i I was part of my first diversity and inclusion initiative. There was a big push for diversity in the in the United Kingdom. And, uh, and we were part of a huge, big wave and movement that just flipped at the end of the 90s, went mm. back into the dark ages, oh. and we got buried for 20 years uh, mm. for, you know, coming slowly out. Um, so this is a real thing. This can happen. This can mm. happen again. So when you say this moment, I feel it is incumbent on us to be really, not on us, but on everybody who says they're invested in change, mm -hmm. to really understand um, what is it gonna take, not to promote my career, right? I would love to um, have opportunities now that I've been missing out on for the past 20 years and get some funding for my work um, and visibility, obviously. But we want to create systemic change so that our children don't have to go mm. through this again, which is to entirely possible, as we've seen. Yeah. Um, what does systemic change look like? Is mm -hmm. And we need to be very clear about it and very focused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very mm -hmm. true. There is there's so much in what the three of you just said that are just things that have been in my mind for the past few years uh, as I've gained more experience in programming and for myself personally a lot of that has been finding the history of the black folks who came before me who were doing the same work because this moment is an individual it's collective and it's happened again and again and I think that um, that is the function of white supremacy to have us forget that we already did this you know and then to collect us you know in this group and be like what can we do when it's like it's not really it's not our thing to undo um, and Francis, and you talked a lot about um, outsourcing funding to community, outsourcing funding to international bodies. And Anishka, you talked a lot about um, making sure who you work with is who you want to be with, you know, which is, of course, a privilege, but it makes such a difference, especially for um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So what I'm really hearing here is what, what I've known, what you've known, what any BIPOC person watching this known, which is that um, the rules for white people are not the rules 
the same rules for us. And particularly within that, that we have to kind of be making our own rules, um, especially in terms of when you think of the fact of Canada's history of filmmaking, it has been historically used to erase us. And it's specifically, especially I should say, especially to erase black folks and especially to erase indigenous folks. And I think, you know, even having this conversation without an indigenous programmer present feels so just wow. wrong. I think I, I would love to see a panel on this same subject featuring for indigenous programmers because the specificities within that lived history are just, that, that's a whole nother panel, you know, creating quote unquote Canadian film within a settler colonial state. All of this is to say, <laughs> um, I'm wondering about um, the ways in which you three have been able to kind of personally form your own ecosystems and what are the ways you've been able to integrate um, what might be referred to as the unofficial or by some people who might be trying to maintain optics, even unprofessional. Unprofessional is often a word that is just used in place of you're too loud and you're of color. Um, and also the ways in which you've, you've brought the personal into your work to kind of push yeah. forward your work and to push forward, um, you know, supporting the work of BIPOC creators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, every time we open um, every screening night of Emerging Lens, we open with a cultural performance. So that would be, you know, a musician, that could be painters. We've had painter, uh, someone actually sing and perform while another person is painting what they're singing and performing. We've had graphic artists do that. We've had spoken word people. We've had dancers. And I mean, I'm not just talking, um, you know, little ballet dances. I'm talking about your good old fashioned African stomp dancing <laughs> as loud as you can be. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's how we've kept it personal. That's how we've kept it um, to our culture because when we're talking creation even a short film what what's on there we have our hair our makeup our you know our costuming you know all of this is involved in our performance so live performances and then we we turn the attention to the um to the work the short works and um yeah and just we love to eat so every time at the end of um each screening we have a lovely feast by a local um you know local soul food <laughs> provider <laughs> So we and and folks, non BIPOC folks, have enjoyed that food. They've chowed down on some curry mm -hmm. chicken, you know. So we just that's how that's how we love. That's how we enjoy. That's how we you know when we're home enjoying um, movies and whatnot. You know, we want to bring that experience to folks, and they love it. You know. Um, I guess two things from my point of view. One is. Uh, you know, I believe in the primacy of the um, authentic voice. Everybody's using that phrase now. But for me, um, you know, storytelling is personal. You know, storytelling is um, like breathing. It's like therapy. It's necessary for human existence. Everybody has a story. Everybody, and and we, and the, a tool of, um, of capitalist, uh, co colonial um, oppression has been to silence us. That 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 relationship is very important to understand. And so, reclaiming our voices and telling our stories, all of them. Like I believe in that that we should have everybody's story. So I'm not I'm not in the business of telling anybody what stories to tell. But I want you. I I need. To, to know that it's your story, not not necessarily that it's autobiographical, but it's your voice. And so that's been very important to me as a curatorial um, requisite um, coming from, 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 from the communities that I serve. And then the other piece of it has been absolutely um, being engaged with my with audiences and audiences are not a monolithic um, thing. Audiences are individual human beings who tell me over and over and over and over again how important it is to them the what I do that they feed off like food, like breath, like yeah. health, like it's in terms of building the beloved community. It has been essential to me um, to continually connect with audiences, with individual human beings who, and, and to build to build that. So though, I don't know if that's what you were asking, but those are the, 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 the personal things that yeah. came to mind in terms of what drives and guides the work that I do. No, that's exactly what I'm asking. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, the whole, th- I would agree with, um, with everything that's already been said, the whole thing is personal. <laughs> um, you know, you don't pick a career in the arts because it's lucrative. <laughs> um, some people you, do. Some people I mean, have read the um, wrong manuals. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, <laughs> they're a problem. None of it. None of it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you do it because you love it so much, and because that experience of of, of talking to somebody mm-hmm. after a film um, when they've been moved by that film, by that story is, is such a gift. And that's, you know, like that's, that's the whole, yeah, that's the reason that you go through all of the like agonizing planning and everything. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I've always tried to surround myself with peers and and um peers who you know share my ethics and um who care about the work that I do um and I'm lucky enough to like work with a lot of those people um and you know mentorship has actually been kind of a hard thing for me to find pretty much my whole life um I grew up in a really white environment um and you know mentorship from that kind of place turned out to be a bit of a toxic nightmare um and you know so I really only found mentors of color who were women of color when I was much older Mm. um and so um yeah I think that that in itself it has been kind of a struggle and I, I think might continue to be a struggle for young programmers of color um because we don't often see ourselves in positions of authority um you know, like Jesse went getting that job at Canada Council, like that's a huge deal, you know, like that's a huge, huge deal. Um, and I don't know that that would have happened in the same way um, 10 years ago when I was really starting um, my career as a, as a curator. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think that um, if you surround yourself with folks who want to uplift your work, um, and also if you approach the work as an educational opportunity, that's something that I do. Um, I kind of, people ask me how I program, um, and I really try not to program based on identity other than the identity that I'm constrained, the identities that I'm constrained to as a queer, (laughs) trans and two-spirit, you know, festival. I really like, is the story good? And are the people behind the camera, the people who are represented on screen? Mm-hmm. Um, has the process been, um, you know, like what, what what has the process of filming been like for this particular project? Like that's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in and I have a wide thematic palette and, um, and I kind of program for mm-hmm. my parents who are straight, one of them's white and one of them's, um, uh, my dad's the person of color, he's a Tamil man. And um, I, yeah, I I weirdly program for them because they're quite open-minded and if they can get it, I feel like anyone can get it. Like if they're in their (laughs) seventies and they're both straight and one of them's white and one of them's a man and they enjoyed the festival and you know, like, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm doing something, I'm doing something right um, because they're invested in me. They're invested in my community, um, even if they're not from my community. So I also want to reach you know, those folks as well, because, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to silo what I do specifically, but I always want to center my community, which is always a BIPOC community. Um, and there are lots of challenges in that because I have a very Mm -hmm. mixed audience that I'm, that I'm programming for. Um, so there are a lot of conversations that happen um, during the festival and during the rest of the year um, about, about intersectionality and about representation and the histories of representation. And we're already working in an industry that was like formulated out of like as a colonial tool and was used to map territories like this technology was used to map and um, dissect and parse out territories for empires and it's been used to distribute false information about indigenous people from all parts of the world 
all over the world. So we're already like working with a form that has been tainted from the very beginning as a tool of white supremacy. So like could also go into like film itself as like kind of a problem that we are reinventing at like with our view behind the camera. Um, I'm going off on a tangent now. <laughs> no, I love it. We're all like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> I think um, also we have, we have time for a few more questions for me, but just for folks watching at home, please make sure to put your questions in. We have a question and answer period. So let us know what's on your mind. Um, but I think a lot of, what I'm gleaning from this conversation, a lot of what I've gleaned from similar conversations like it, I feel like, um, like Francis Ann said, we are in a repeating economy of uh, quote unquote change. And that brings with it kind of, you know, diversity panels, inclusion panels, equity panels, and we're kind of made to repeat the same work that those who have come before us um, have done. And I think there is a way in which it can be done in a extractive way, which is not productive for BIPOC folks. And it's a way to kind of quote unquote, teach white folks who are watching how to be better, which is not really how that works. Um, so in lieu of asking for your suggestions for the white folks wa watching how they can do better, I think we've covered that. I think June, there was a lot of reading dispersed this June. I think we can just return to the reading. Um, and I, I just really wanted to know, um, what organizations outside of your own do you turn to for examples of folks who have uh, long undertaken this work? So, I'll let the one go first. I have to think about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a difficult one because, to a very large extent, um, as we've discussed, you know, we've been working in in silos. Um, you know, I'm I can't believe that I never met you before, Sarah. <laughs> I've you know, never met Anushka. I've never met Tara. This is outrageous. Yeah. But I think it's it's because of the way that we are isolated away from each other, and it's tragic. So, a lot of the time when we've been working, we've been making it up on our own. You know, yeah. um, I will. You know, I want to acknowledge uh, um, real world and uh, and uh, um, that that festival because uh, because because it has re you know like I think that in in Canada uh, she started that she that was the first diverse festival here um, and she made it her business to reach out to to everyone um, right off the top whereas for me I feel like it was important to grow my community first you know to to, to serve my audiences first. And so I was really nose to the grindstone, um, um, just building from, you know, and creating my own structure and making mistakes and, and, and serving what I saw to be my core audience, which is the audience and the, and the creators. I'm not sure there is any institution that is like ours, really. I mean, I also individuals. So much of it, like we, so much of our experience is individual, and then suddenly we become. I mean, Cohen, right. I yeah. the organization that was the most influential to me was the BBC because I spent 15 years there, and it was an incredible place to work. Um, and coming out of that, I thought I just want to continue to work in a place like that, but I wanted to be serving people of color and black people and black stories and my stories rather than not. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was really to create a, create a new kind of institution, really, um, that was modeled on that, but that was for our stories. Yeah. Yeah. Real world is really special. I worked, oh my gosh, so many moons ago um, with Tanya Williams on a, on a film. I think I was like, Ted, oh my goodness, just coming up in the industry. But um, so I, I also hold um, Real Festival in high regard as well as um, Fabian Coles' foundation. She actually has seven um, festivals around the world and she's certainly a force to be reckoned with. So I do look to her guidance in her festival. And she also brought one um, down here to Halifax, Halifax Black Film Festival. So very happy to, to have another one on board that we're not the only ones here. We have support and, you know, whatnot. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I would say that would be it for me. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I would just echo what you were saying, Sarah Tai, it, that it's been mostly about individual relationships for me mm -hmm. within specific institutions. Um, and I want to do a thank you and a shout out to Barbara Shaneros, who suggested me for this panel um, from uh, Telefilm. Um, uh, thank you so much. And she's been someone that I've felt so fortunate to work with um, in Vancouver. And yeah, I think I have sort of an inherent distrust of institutions. Uh, so I tend to put my faith in the people who are there because, you know, you can trust them because you can talk to a person. You can't really talk to an institution um, because that's a lot of people and it's like boards and, you know, everything. And so, um, yeah, knowing individual curators who have and or or folks who work in funding institutions or government institutions or venues. Um, yeah, it's been those personal relationships that have been really, really important. Um, and and um, yeah, you, you know, you find the people you can trust um, and that trust gets built over years of like seeing each other's work and um, and working together. So yeah, that's really mm -hmm. been, it's really mm -hmm. been about the people for me. Can I add to that a little bit? I feel that it's um, within the industry, I feel um, it's, it's really important uh, that we build those relationships with each other. And it's a little bit easier now because all of us are a little bit less under pressure. Yeah. And you, I feel like um, when all of us are, are like, you know, basically with a, a knee on our neck and we can't breathe, we can't eat, we can't, you know, we're, we're struggling to survive, which has been a lot of our, well, my reality for a long time. I And I see it in others who are struggling equally. It has been really difficult. Like you, you build individual one-off relationships um, with certain people. But then as I find as an industry community, it has been difficult because we're all suffering so so hard you know mm -hmm. um but now we have an opportunity you know i think it's really important and i really look forward to 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 building with all of you i'm so excited mm -hmm. um to connect with you all and with every uh, the young people who are i mean if i have role models really it's it's the it's when i say young people these are people in their 40s they're people's mothers they're, they're, you know but the voices that are coming through now they're not young necessarily but they're they're mm -hmm. they're being allowed to speak in the in in the in the main street the people i'm i'm meeting in 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 online groups i sit back and i'm like you go you go <laughs> They are saying and, and doing things that it really takes the pressure off me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not used to being the person in the room who picks my foot up and puts it straight into my mouth and says, you know, there's a, there's a naked white man in the room. And <laughs> I just get to sit back and uh, let them do, let other people do the work because we are, because we all have the same experience and it's a fantastic feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that really what, is bringing together all of our experience and just BIPOC experience generally is that individual collection connection and the collectivity <laughs> within communities. And I think that's something that going forward, we're really going to need to turn to more because those are kind of the radical models that will provide what we, what we need, what we mm -hmm. need so much now. Um, in our last few minutes, I do have a few audience questions for you all. Let me just see in here. We have the wonderful Lucy Mukherjee from Tribeca Film Festival. She has two questions and I'm gonna ask them both. <laughs> um, do you feel like lasting change is possible within white institutions? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, you can say, oh, yeah, 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 I think it, we are all waiting with bated breath. Right? <laughs> we don't know. It's never happened before, right? Right. Yeah. I, I believe it's possible if you program and you lead and guide the way you see your own family and just um, live on and love on the way that, you know, do, whatever you're doing that is successful in your own community, do for other communities. It, there's no secret sauce. I always say there's no secret sauce. It's just the same love and care that you're giving and do your work for white programmers and white creators. Just spread it around. <laughs> yeah. 
I think, yeah, I think that's a bigger question than just even like in within film programming and yeah. within the industry. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of things that need to change for that to come true. Um, and I think, you know, we have so many incredible people fighting on so many different fronts um, that will help. Um, well, you know, like this is a decolonial issue. This mm -hmm. is, um, this is, yeah, it's, it's, it's so tied in with so many things. It's like an anti-corporate issue, you know, like one of the hugest things for, for me with wrapping my head around this question is like, how do we unwhite supremacy, the arts and the film industry, given where money comes from, you know, and yeah. it comes from a lot of like, corporations um or from the state which got its money by murdering and pillaging and like that's where our money comes from mm -hmm. so you know how do we do it's yeah <laughs> and, and then all the questions start piling on top of each other and it's a um, big big it's a big big question and, and i think it's, possible. Ways, it's absolutely not up to us you know it's not mm -hmm. It is, it is like if, they, if there's an election, yeah, homework. <laughs> if there's an election tomorrow and the conservatives win, then that's going to be um, a big. That's going to change everything. Yeah, I think it requires like diligence and and a preparation. If you're someone doing that work within your own organization, mm. just a preparation that like it will come at every single angle. It will come not only from a programming like perspective but also a financial perspective an hr perspective like the way that your work culture is like mm -hmm. everything because it's yeah. it's it's in everything white supremacy is so like it just Brilliant. gets inside yeah. and so you have to be prepared if you want to take that on within your organization you have to be prepared for it to come at you from all sides and and to yeah to have to think about it really creatively because we're also like inventing this new world mm -hmm. as we talk about building it, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, I guess um, showing representation and inclusion without having to say it, you know, just if you're embodying that, you don't have to say it. You don't have to be checking off these boxes and whatnot and, oh, pat myself on the back. I have a new black dot, 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 dot. I have a new yeah. black, blah, 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 blah. I just, just do it because you, because that voice or that work or that, uh, what they've created is a great story. Just program it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You all are far too kind in your answer. Lucy, I would have said no. <laughs> 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 there's hope, there's hope. <laughs> Um, and I have, we, we have time for one final question, and I think this, this is a question I get a lot personally, I think is so helpful for people who are emerging programmers. Um, and the question is, where would you encourage BIPOC programmers to find independent paid avenues to curate for the communities outside of mainstream spaces? I mean, they're just do a search in your city. Um, there's so many smaller organizations that um, are doing this work. Um, and just because you don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist because we're still severely under-resourced um, as communities and as artists. Um, so I would, yeah, I would like, the only reason that I find out about anything that I wanna work with is by going to stuff which yeah, kind yeah, of is okay. harder to do now <laughs> um but yeah there's so many creative amazing human beings out there making brilliant work that you can be a part of um or you know you could also do it yourself which all of us have have done at different points in our careers and some of us are doing it now on this panel like starting your own organizations um yeah yeah, I just get a little creative. Like I've I've gotten um, funding for a film before from um, Status of Women, just because I've said, okay, yeah. you know what? Before the film, we're going to do some workshops around this idea, and then we're going to film that content and then turn it into a film afterwards. So that's what our end result will be. And I've done video camps, and the kids will get together and do all these things and learn dances, and then at the end is a music video. That's a short work or and documentary. So just get creative with it. You know, do some work up front, some workshops and that kind of thing, and then. 
then turn it into a piece at the end. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to cut you off, Francis Ann, but we're running out of time. And I'm so sorry, but that is the last of our time for this panel. So I want to thank you all so deeply for taking the time to join us here today and to share your knowledge. And of course, I want to thank Telefilm, Telefilm and the tip industry. And I think um, if there's anything that this panel is really teaching us, it's that our own experience is our expertise. So just go out there and do it yourself. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you guys. Yeah. 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 <laughs>